Hello and welcome to Unusual Careers, where we explore the variety of careers in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math here at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. My name is Shelly, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be your host for today. Before we meet today's guests, you will see two polls pop up on your screen. First, have you ever heard of a reproductive biologist, yes or no? Second, which of the following subjects do you think is involved in reproductive biology, science, technology, engineering, art, or math? While you take some time to answer that poll, I'm going to go over the format of the program today. This webinar is live captioned. You'll wanna locate that CC button at the bottom of your screen in order for those to appear. You will also notice that this program is being interpreted in American Sign Language. This feature is best viewed from a desktop computer instead of a tablet or phone. If you're having trouble with either service, please chat us so we can assist you. Remember, this is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you. However, we encourage you to engage with us in a number of ways. You already saw that we'll be launching polls throughout the program. Additionally, you'll see that the Q&A is open. Please use that Q&A at any time to ask questions of our guest. Try to keep your questions on topic, and you can always check under the My Questions column to see if your question was already answered. Today's program will be about 45 minutes with an additional 15 minutes at the end for a live Q&A where we will address as many of your questions as time will allow. Educators, if you are streaming for your whole class, be sure to keep your keyboard close by to chime in on their behalf. Lastly, you'll see that the chat is also open for you to message us. Now I want you to find that chat and tell us your name and where you are joining from. And if anyone could guess the uh, answer for our riddle, where, um, what do biologists post on Instagram? Will you find the chat and tell us where you're joining us from? I want to quickly introduce you to my team who is helping me today behind the scenes. We have Erica, Caden, and Emily also uh, answering your questions. And we have a very special chat expert. Today we have Daniela Chavez, another reproductive biologist here at the National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. So you may see some responses from her in the chat and Q&A as well. Let's see where folks are joining us from. We have Devin from Stanford, California. We have the James Rudder Middle School Colonial Virtual Program. Welcome. Welcome from Austin, Texas. Eugene, Oregon. Laura, Oregon. Miss Phillips class in Elk Grove, California. Welcome. West Springfield, Virginia. So close to the National Zoo. Welcome Alex, Victoria, and Savannah from Gresham, Oregon. Hi, Ray, joining from Southeast Michigan, studying uh, biology and zoology, fantastic. More Oregon, we have Delaware, Virginia. Oh, hi, Gabriel from Puerto Rico, amazing. Isaiah, I'm assuming this is Sacramento, Cleveland, Ohio, Baltimore, Maryland. Welcome Mrs. Jones class from Oregon, Reggie from Virginia. Oh, welcome. We have um, some folks joining all the way from Germany as well. Eric from Indonesia. We are just spanning the globe today and I am just so excited that you have all joined us for today's program. So once again, Welcome to Unusual Careers. Today, I am so excited to kick off Women's History Month and welcome Dr. Pei Chi Lee to the program. Hi, Pei Chi, welcome. Hi. You wanna start by introducing yourself? Of course, um, my name is Pei Chi Lee. I am a reproductive biologist in the Zoo Center for Species Survival. Wow, okay, so when I hear reproductive biologists, I think of lots of baby animals. What does it mean to be a reproductive biologist? Well, so we are scientists, so we do all kinds of experiments that help us to understand animal reproduction. And we use the information we learn and trying to develop new techniques that can 
help us to make sure we can still make baby animals in the future. That's awesome. So we, the goal is baby animals, which is fantastic. Yeah. So you said experiments, and I know experiments are a big part of science. So you're definitely mm -hmm. hitting the science part of STEAM. What types of experiments are you running? Well, so the goal of my work is to establish and expand genome resource banks. So I'm working on developing techniques that help us to preserve reproductive cells. Okay, so you said a genome resource bank. Mm -hmm. I know the word genome is related to our genes or our DNA. Is this right. sort of a storage of DNA? Yeah, it's kind of like that. It's basically a collection of biological samples. It can be reproductive cells like sperm and eggs. It can be tissue samples. It can also include samples like blood or urine or milk, really anything we can collect from an animal that can show us more and help us to understand more about the species. Wow, so this um, picture on the screen right now is just some examples of all of these different biological samples that you're storing. And I'm gonna launch a poll here for our audience. How do you think that these samples, these biological samples um, are stored in this bank? Do you think that they're refrigerated, frozen, dried, or maybe some other way? Um, and if you can think of any other samples, feel free to put it in the chat that you think might be kept in this bio bank, this resource bank. Great, I'll give you another few seconds on that poll. Oh, you're all doing really, really well here. I'm gonna close that poll in another five, four, three, two, and one. Let's see what folks thought. All right, so the majority thought frozen, followed by refrigerated, a few said dried, and other. What, how are the majority of these samples preserved? Well, actually, it, it can be any, all of those answers. So it depends on the sample types. Some of them can be stored in freezers. Some like cells or tissues, we will preserve, it, preserve them with a technique that we call cryopreservation. And then these samples are usually kept in liquid nitrogen tanks. So they are this huge tank with liquid nitrogen that can provide a very stable temperature at minus 30, 320 degree Fahrenheit. So it's a very cold temperature that keep our samples safe and stable. So the majority of these samples are preserved through cryopreservation, which you said is negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Is that what you said? Yeah, that's right. That is very, very cold. I don't do well in DC winter, let alone that cold. So I think we actually have some awesome videos that you took of walking us through exactly how you um, preserve some of these samples. So let's play some videos. And if you could just walk us through what we're seeing right now. So this is a video when I'm trying to um, preserve some ovarian tissue from a dama gazelle. So of course, first I have to prepare everything I have uh, I need for this experiment. And this is a pair of ovaries that I received from our pathologist in the zoo. Wow, so these are the ovaries from a dama gazelle, you said. Mm -hmm. Yep, so once I have them, I will start to dissect the ovaries and I, I'm trying to cut them into smaller pieces of uh, ovarian cortex. So these little pieces will contain dozens of uh, early stage oocytes that still have the potential in the future to develop into mature eggs that we can use for breeding purposes or research purposes. That's so cool. So in this video, you're in the microscope and you're cutting up those samples. Yeah, so I'm just cutting them into smaller pieces in this video. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. We do yeah. have a so question. You can you tell us quickly what are ovaries exactly? So ovaries are the organ in the females that can produce 
oocyte or eggs that is important for the reproduction and breeding of the animal. Fantastic. And so what are we looking at here? Is this through your microscope? Yeah, so right now you're looking at these small pieces of ovarian tissues that I dissect that will have a lot of early stage oocyte in them. And this is what we are trying to cryopreserve. That's so neat. So next, I actually put them on these needles and we nickname these tissue kebab. Tissue we, kebabs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we do this so that it's like easier for us to do the experiment so that they don't just flow around. And we will expose these tissues to protective reagent that can protect the cells and tissues from any damage that may be caused by freezing them. So in this way, they can stay safe even though they are in a freezing temperature. Sort of like when we put things in our freezer, we don't want them to get freezer burn. So we exactly. want to keep them enclosed. Very cool. Yeah, because yeah, when you put things in freezer, they actually turn into ice and ice is very damaging to cells. So this protectant is actually preventing ice from forming even at a very low temperature. Awesome. So then I put these tissue kebabs into liquid nitrogen to freeze them. Wow. And then we will put them into these tubes that we call cryotubes. And so I'm just assembling them with these long tongues because it's uh, extremely cold. So you definitely won't, don't want to get too close to them. So I'm using these tools to put them into these cryo tubes, and then we will put them onto these long cryo canes. And that is what we're gonna use to store them. And every tubes and cans will be labeled. It will help us to find them when we need them. And it will also be linked with all the information about this animal that we receive it from. So this is what they look like after they are all assembled. We have tubes in kings that's protected. That's so neat. And you can see the, is it smoke, a gas coming off of that? Yeah, so liquid nitrogen, they actually evaporate pretty easily. So all the smokes are evaporation from liquid nitrogen. So they just turn into nitrogen gas. And then in the end, we'll put them into these liquid nitrogen tanks. Wow. So this will be part of our genome resource bank. This is so cool because it's cold, get it? <laughs> <laughs> this is really, really neat. So in the your bio bank, this genome resource bank, is it just mm -hmm. rows and rows of freezers and liquid nitrogen tanks like this? Yeah, right now, right now that is the case, but I'm actually also working on developing new methods so that we can store them without the need of liquid nitrogen. So you're working on finding other ways to preserve them. And audience, I want you to put in the chat right now, what are some reasons you might think that we are exploring or Peichi is exploring other um, methods for preserving specimens? Peichi, what exactly are you looking into? Why, why can't we just keep freezing using liquid nitrogen? Well, there's... We can still keep freezing, but you know our goal is to really expand this re genome resource bank to as many species, as many individuals as we can. And we want to be able to keep them for a very long period of time. So liquid nitrogen, even though, like I say, provide a very stable cold temperature, it does take up a lot of space because you see we need all these tanks and it evaporate very fast, so we need to keep adding more liquid nitrogen, so it costs a lot of money over time. Yeah. So if we can find a cheaper way to store them, then that would definitely save us a lot of money and time. Alex and Andrew definitely got it right in the chat. They said because it's expensive. And Yoko said maybe to see if there's another way to really see the DNA. That's a really great idea. 
Um, and just uh, you mentioned earlier, one of the downsides of cryopreservation is water freezes and it can damage some samples potentially. Mm -hmm. And I think we have yeah. an example in this video right here. <laughs> can you tell us what we're seeing? Yeah, so this is a quick video to show that if we just uh, freeze things, in this case grapes, in liquid nitrogen without any protection, it actually will endure uh, essentially cryo injury, you know, we call it. So it basically damage caused to your cells because of the cold. So you can see that the grape just cracked open after we just dump it into liquid nitrogen like this, and they become very fragile after you freeze it like this. That's why when we're doing cryopreservation, it's not simply just dump things into liquid nitrogen. It actually have some procedures before that to make sure that we are protecting the cells or tissues that we're preserving from any potential cryo image or cryo damage. Got it. And so we had a question from Ridge about, I think it was what the tissue kebabs were in, what kind of um, liquid, and that was that protectant so that we don't yeah. see that cryo damage like we just saw with mm -hmm. the grapes. Very cool. So Besides cryopreservation, you are working on other methods of preservation. What methods are you um, researching and experimenting with? Yeah, so we were thinking about, okay, what would be the easier way to preserve without the need of liquid nitrogen? We're thinking about, instead of freezing, we can dry them because we're thinking about, okay, kind of like instant noodles where you can dry them and then they can keep on the shelf for a very long time that would be a very easy way to store. So our plan is to try to dry our cells. And there are actually many different methods that we can potentially do that. And the one that we're working on is through the use of a microwave. A microwave. So Leia asked, Leia or Leah asked in the um, chat, is it like dry ice? But no, you said a microwave. Is this like a microwave that's in my kitchen that I'm using for my leftovers? Well, the the principle is the same, but the one we're using, we can better control the power and the temperature because you know our goal is to dry it, but not to cook it. So we need to control the low temperature so that the samples remain alive while we're drying them. Very cool. So it does look kind of similar. I believe this is the microwave that you use. Mm -hmm. That's so neat. So how did you start to think about drying samples instead of freezing them? Where did you get this idea? Well, that's a good question. We were actually inspired by some little organisms in nature. So there are some species that can actually tolerate really dry conditions in their environment and they can stay in a dry form for a long time until like raining season comes and they just get rehydrated and become active again. So we are trying to try to mimic that for ourselves. That's really, really cool. And I think we have a, a picture of one of these species that um, can dry out and come back to life. And we already have an, a guest in the chat, but if anyone knows what this animal is, what this is called, put it in the chat. A lot of you are getting it. And while we get some answers in the chat, um, Paige, there was a quick, uh, someone asked dehydrating. Is this similar, like people might dehydrate jerky or herbs? Oh, yes, yes, it's actually a very similar idea. But what we're trying to do is a little bit more complicated because when you're drying jerkies, you don't expect the jerkies to stay alive, but we do want our cells to stay alive. That's what makes it more complicated. Fantastic. And we are getting so many answers. You are all getting it correct. Paige, what is this animal that we're looking at? Well, I think everyone's getting it. It's yeah. a tardigrade, or yeah. some, some people know it's also called the water bear. So, you know, I think it's the most amazing animal in the world because it can survive all kinds of really extremely harsh environments, including dry conditions. This is really, really neat. So you said it, it can survive these dry um uh, environments and then almost dry out and then come back to life. And I think we have some other examples of species that do this. How do they do this? How do they manage to just come back to life after being dry? Well, that's 
same question scientists are asking. So from studying these animals, scientists found out that one of the ways they do it is by produce a specific type of sugar called trehalose in their cells. And trehalose turn out to be a great protectant to prevent the cells from any damage due, due to drying condition. So what we're trying to do is just trying to recreate that condition in the cells that we're trying to preserve in the lab. And of course, we first saw uh, first challenge that we have tried to solve is that most of the cells we're trying to preserve are mammalian cells and mammals don't produce these type of sugar. So the first thing we need to do is try to deliver this sugar into these mammalian cells that we're trying to preserve and then we can dry them afterwards. That is so neat that you're taking the species that does this naturally, but because mammals don't produce the sugar that allows us to survive in dry areas, dry places without water, you are experimenting and seeing if you can insert this sugar, deliver this sugar into mammal cells mm -hmm. and dry them. That is so, so neat. So. What I remember from my biology classes and for our all of our viewers, if you remember from your biology classes, that a cell is the smallest unit that makes up a living thing and that can live on its own. So as we see from this photo and some previous photos, you're spending a lot of time near your microscope, I'm guessing. Do you have just the smallest tools that are delivering the sugar into the cells? Well, there are actually several different methods that scientists are trying to deliver this sugar into the cells. Uh, the method I'm trying right now, I actually work with a group of engineers. They can make this um, specific type of nanoparticles that can enter the cells without damaging the cells. So what we're doing is we make these nanoparticles into kind of like a bubble and then we can put trellos inside this bubble so that these nanoparticles can then help us to bring the trellos into the cells without damaging it. That is so cool. And we have a great question of how do you collect the sugar or create the sugar? Is that through the okay. nanoparticles? Well, luckily, people already know how to synthesize the sugar so we can just buy them don't really need to try to extract them from any of these species. We can just buy them from a shop. That's really, really neat. Nanoparticles, I never would have guessed. So all of this work that you're doing, you're building up this biobank, the storage of all these biological samples, you're experimenting to find new ways of preserving and the overall goal of the biobank um, is to have dehydrated and frozen samples of animals from all different taxa from all over the world. What samples, what types of cells are you currently working with and experimenting on? Well, right now I am mainly working with reproductive cells. So that's sperm and egg and also reproductive tissues, including ovarian tissues and testicular tissues. And we're actually using domestic cats as our model. Domestic cats. That's very interesting because we are in a zoo. Um, and I thought that you would maybe be working with more endangered animals. Why not the cheetah or a clouded leopard or a lion or a tiger? Well, because right now we're still developing the techniques. So we have to test many different conditions to find out what is the best protocol for us to use. So for that, we actually need a lot of samples. So instead of using our very precious cheetah samples, for example, domestic cat is just more widely available to us. We're working with the local spay and neuter clinics so that they can give us some of the samples from their surgeries and we can work on them quite often you know, there are a lot of domestic cats out there. Yes, that's really, really neat. And a very similar theme last month in Unusual Careers, um, our zoo nutritionist, Erin Kendrick, 
was saying something similar that she uses domestic cats to help model the diet profiles for the big cats here at the zoo. So this sounds very similar that once you figure out how to better preserve cat samples for the domestic cat gametes, then we can then apply it to our more endangered species samples, correct? Yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Fantastic. And from this picture, like we said, the cat, the domestic cat can help us um, and be applied to our more endangered cat species, our cheetahs, our tigers, our lions, but can also tell us a lot about human reproduction too. Yeah, which I think yeah because really cat can also be a good model to study human reproduction because there are some similarities there. And in fact, what the technique we're trying to develop, it can also benefit human fertility clinic in the future. So because of that, a lot of our funding is actually coming from the uh, National Institute of Health because of this uh, connection. Wow. So we're not just working on creating baby animals here at the zoo, but potentially um, some human babies as well. So I have another poll for our audience here about building up these biobanks. Why are they so important? Why is it so important for us to have these samples um, from all these different species? Um, why are they important, do you think, for breeding needs, research, insurance populations? This is select all that apply. And if you have any other ideas about why these biobanks are important, put it in the chat as well. We would love to hear your thoughts. I'll give you another few seconds on that poll. And I also just want to point out while we're on this screen that that cat in the center of your screen is actually um, one of our zoo educators cats, uh, Bailey. So glad she could make an appearance. All right, I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, and one. All right, we had an idea in the chat as well to preserve biodiversity. And it's pretty even across, let's share these results. Uh, number one answer was research followed by breeding needs and insurance populations. Why are biobanks important, Peachy? Well, actually we can do all those things with biobanks. Yeah. So let's talk about breeding needs. How are these biobanks being used for breeding? Well, I'll give a famous example is our giant panda cub, Xiao Qi Qi. It was born in 2020. Yeah, so he, he um, as a result of uh, our genome resource bank, we used a frozen semen from Tianpian to inseminate nation, and we got Xiao Titi. Wow. And then what sorts of research are you doing? Well, for research, it's actually not limited to reproductive research. For example, we have scientists in the zoo that are using some of the samples to sequence the genome of various different species. And with this genome, it can teach us so much about the species. We can learn about their evolution, their population structure, we can learn about diseases. So it can be very helpful. Wow. And then the last one we said was an insurance population. What is an insurance population? Yeah, that's really the idea that having the a sample bank, then we can keep the genome of an individual, even if the individual is no longer with us. So I think someone said we we'll preserve biodiversity, and that is exactly the idea that we don't lose the genome from the population that we currently have, and we can potentially use them if the worst happens, we have this insurance in our bank. And and these are some great examples. To, yeah. yeah, if I want to give an example, a, a pretty extreme example right now would be the Northern White Rhino because we only have two female left in the whole world. And scientists now are actually trying to use the samples in the bank and combine that with uh, some advanced assisted reproductive techniques, trying to see if they can save this species from extinction. Wow. So. The example you just get the north gave the northern white rhino. There are only two females left, so you are using 
frozen biobanked sperm to hopefully impregnate these females and bring back the uh, northern white rhino from the brink of extinction. That yeah, so is unbelievable. And we have some more local examples of this. The black-footed ferret is yeah, yeah. native to North America and the same thing happened, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were once considered extinct until a small population is found and samples from those small population has been banked and scientists have been studying them and finding ways to breed them. So now they actually have um, great success in breeding this species and release them back into the wild. And we actually have been introducing some of those early samples that we froze back into the population to make sure that we can still maintain some sort of genetic diversity within this population. That's really, really neat. And on that note, we had a question from Sethi. Are we able to reproduce more ancient animals this way, like a woolly mammoth or a dinosaur? Well, so like a Jurassic Park situation? Yeah. <laughs> well, there are technology out there that there are people are definitely looking into that. Um, I think there's no consensus on that yet, but if we're really trying to bring back some animal, it probably won't be something so that extinct so long ago, like a dinosaur. Yeah. But maybe something more recent that went extinct because of human population and human yeah. activities. Maybe the National Museum of Natural History is working on <laughs> dinosaurs or mammoths. That's great. So I think it is just very, very evident how your work is helping to save species. Like you mentioned, you are saving these samples, creating this biobank of all of these animals to help with their breeding, to help with biodiversity, to help bring them back from extinction. Um, what, el what else are you doing in your work? Yeah, so even though most of my work, we are working a lab with domestic cat, but we actually also um, work with the vet staff and keepers in the zoo to participate in uh, sample collections or all sorts of assisted reproductive uh, procedures. Like I think in the, in the slides we're showing, like we're doing some semen collections uh, on different animals. And we're also doing things like uh, artificial insemination of some of the species, trying to make some baby animals from them. So it's always, for me, it's always exciting to be part of these procedures because you, it's a proof that our work is really linked with all these species that we're trying to save. Absolutely. So can you talk a little bit more about assisted reproduction? What exactly is that and why do we need to do it? Yeah, so normally when uh, natural breeding doesn't happen for a number of reasons, we can step in and try to help them breed. And this is kind of the same idea as human fertility clinic that there are all sorts of techniques available. People probably heard of test tube babies. So it's, we are trying to use all those same techniques in animals. But of course, because every species is different, so you cannot just do everything exactly the same. A lot of research actually has to go into these different techniques, trying to optimize them for different species in order to successfully make babies from them. So that is what a lot of scientists in the zoo are working on right now. That's very cool. And I know a pretty infamous example here at the National Zoo and at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute is our clouded leopards. Notoriously are not great at breeding. And so you and your team come in with the assisted reproduction. And yeah. a great example that our institution was the first to produce clouded leopard cubs from frozen clouded leopard sperm, right? Uh, I think so, because even though um, artificial insemination has been succeed, actually almost 20 years ago, wow. 
and it only succeed once and then it can never be reproduced again. So there is actually a lot of work done by a scientist here, Pierre Comizoli, and a lot of colleagues in over here in Thailand, different zoos. And you know, they finally fine-tuned the technique and uh, able to now find a more consistent way to inseminate these cats. So it's a great success for us. So this is sort of exactly the intersection of why the research is important, the assisted reproduction is important, the mm -hmm. biobank's important. It all goes hand in hand with conservation. The more we learn and understand about an animal's reproduction, the more we can help them breed, make new babies, grow their populations, reintroduce them to the wild. Um, and again, like we said, prevent them from going extinct, which is just amazing, amazing work. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, our goal is really to, you know, help to have not only having individuals, but having a healthy population. That's why we need to preserve this genetic diversity of all these species. Absolutely. So Peiji, when you were younger, what did you want to be when you grew up? When did you <laughs> decide to become a reproductive biologist? Yeah, I think when I was young, I wanted to be an astronaut. I don't know if any of you are, but for me, that's very cool. Um, but when do I decide to become a reproductive biologist? I, when I was in graduate school, I actually know a lot of reproductive biologists in the medical field, but I did not know there are reproductive biologists in zoos. And I kind of found out about it by chance when I was just like looking around for, you know, if there's any job opportunities and I saw it and it's like, for me, it's like instant click. I was like, I know that's what I want to do. And so here I am. That's really cool. You went from astronaut to a uh, reproductive biologist in a zoo. <laughs> quite, quite the pivot. Um, what advice do you have for any of our students, our folks watching, who might be interested in this career or a similar career? Well, so for me, I'm looking at myself because my background is more um, molecular biology and biochemistry. And, you know, I'm working with people whose background is in engineering, but somehow we're all now working together, trying to advance reproductive science. So I'll say there are like really many different paths that can lead to the same career. So just stay open-minded, go explore all sorts of different opportunities and it might lead you to your own path. That's fantastic. Again, there's just so many careers out there that play a role in conservation. Well, we um, have reached our Q&A and I know some folks might need to jump off to their next class. So I am going to launch our last poll here, just about how did you feel about today's program and how did it leave you feeling? Um, and keep those questions coming into the Q&A. We are um, noting them all. Um, and I'm just so excited, Paige. These are some great questions. Um, so uh, first question we have here is, how did you get all of these body parts, these samples that we're collecting? Where did they all come from? Well, so for most of the samples that come in the zoo collection, most of the cases when the animal unfortunately pass away, and so they will go to our pathology department. And so we will coordinate them to get some of these samples for us to preserve. Occasionally, which doesn't happen very often, but in the case of ovaries or testes, sometimes because of health reasons, the zoo, the zoo staff might decided that the animal needs to be spayed or neutered. So in that case, the animal is still alive, but we get to get their tissue. And we also have um, collaboration with, say, Fish and Wildlife, where on the uh, black-footed ferret population. So if though they're managing this population that's been reintroduced back in Wyoming, so if they any of their black-footed ferret die, they will also help us to collect the ovaries and testes and ship it for us to preserve. 
So even after the animals that are here at the zoo pass away, we can still gather so much information and samples from them to continue exactly. studying them, but also potentially using their DNA for future mm -hmm. breeding. That's really, really neat. Um, and then you said some samples you can just collect from living animals. I know some of our animals at the zoo are actually trained to give voluntary blood. So we can still collect some um, samples from mm -hmm. animals uh, that are here. That's great. Um, let's see. We have a question from Zoe specifically about the cryo injuries with the grape. Did the flesh of the grape expand to make it crack? And can that happen to the egg kebabs? So that is a great question. So as you know, that, that is um, one of the reasons that crack is because of changing volume when it become ice, volume get bigger, so it crack. Um, if you look at more like the molecular level, the ice crystals inside the cells, even if it's not very big, it's actually because it's so rigid, it's likely to damage the structures inside the cell. So that is also one of the reasons that cell will be damaged. So that's why when we're doing cryopreservation with kebab or without, we have to put them through these, uh, what we call cryoprotectants. So they are different protective agents that Scientists has found out that can prevent ice from happening, um, even when we dump them into really, really cold temperatures. So these processes is extremely important to keep the cells alive after we thaw them back up. Very cool. Yeah, so it's the water that when it freezes, it expands. Oh, here we have the video again. And that's what causes it to break. Yeah, so, so the same actually kind of also goes to our desiccation technique, because even though in this case, we don't have water, but we have sugar. And sugar, what we are trying to do is to dry them so that can turn them into a glassy state, which is nice and stable, but with a little bit of flexibility. But if we don't do it right, they can also become crystallized and that crystal will again damage the cell. So that is the balance we need to try to find in order to safely preserve the cells and tissues. Very cool. We have a couple questions in here from um, Aria and Taylor about the variety of animals that you experiment um, on with cells. Um, are you ever working with eggs, like from birds or maybe dogs or other domesticated animals? Well, in our lab, I don't think we have dogs, but we do have, well, actually our chat expert, Daniela, she is working with monkey and sheep. Oh. Um, we also actually used to have a graduate student who is working on human oocytes. So we have, you know, we've been testing it on a few different species. Very cool. Um, there's another great question of, have you ever discovered any, any animals or any big, um, big ideas while doing your research? Any big, big findings? Yeah. <laughs> well, we do have some ideas that we haven't really realized it yet, but maybe one day. Um, one of the thought is that since we are creating this uh, insurance population, in case of you know the worst thing that happened, an extinction happened, so we're like, okay, so maybe we should keep this bank in the space just to be safe. So we definitely have. Uh, have thoughts about sending some of these samples to space just to see how they survive there. And if we ever want to have a space bank, I think a dry sample will again be easier than sending liquid nitrogen tanks out in the space. So just to repeat, you're talking about <laughs> sending some biobank samples to space just to see how they survive and live up there. That, um, that's the idea. <laughs> that is so cool. I think we'll have to get someone from Air and Space on this program if we ever <laughs> make it that far. That's amazing. 
Uh, Devin has a great question about, can you use the biobank samples and then use them in a surrogate of a closely related animal to help in the assisted reproduction? That is a fantastic question. Actually, I think that was done last year. There is a, it's not by our zoo, but some other scientists working in the field, they use um, one of the found in black footed ferret um, genome that we have, and they transfer that into a domestic ferret egg and, and then transfer that egg into a domestic ferret surrogate. And how they actually make the first cloned black-footed ferret. And just so now uh, I believe that ferret is uh, trying to find a mate. So you might hear some good news soon. Just another layer of why this biobank is so important and the research so cool. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, we have some questions about the artificial insemination and we can use Mei Shang, our giant panda, mm -hmm. infamous sure. example, just a little <laughs> bit about the process of how do we go from having, you know, Mei Shang up and about in her giant panda enclosure to Zhao Ji Ji born. Yeah, so yeah, Mei Shang, it's a great example. Um, whenever it involves giant panda breeding, it's really a huge team effort. It involves the keepers, the vet staff, the repro staff, uh, endocrine lab. So it's uh, everyone working together, starting by trying to monitor if she gets in heat, because in the case of giant panda, they only have a very short window that they can get pregnant. So that's about, I think, two days. So we really need to judge by all kinds of signs we can get from their behavior, from their hormone profile. We also look at some uh, vaginal cytology, combine all the data we get, trying to really pinpoint the best time that she can conceive. And with that, um, Usually what we will do is to try to collect some fresh semen from the male because fresh semen usually still have higher quality than the ones that have been cryopreserved because you know they didn't go through that freezing procedure. So if we can, we try to collect fresh semen on the same day and then we will again work with all the staff trying to um, sedate so the female as well, and then we'll just inseminate her with the first semen we just collect. Or in the case in 2020, because of the pandemic, we actually chose not to collect fresh semen so that we don't need that many people on site at the same time. So yeah. we just use um, cryopreserved semen that we have from the male in the past. So I guess in the picture here, you can see we actually, we saw some of these frozen samples from the bank. And then we deliver this semen through a thin tube that we inserted into um, the cervix of the female. And then we can put the sperm through this thin tube inside the vagina. Wow. So again, just reiterating that in 2020, you thawed Tian Tian's sperm that had been frozen in our biobank, did an artificial insemination on Mei Shang, and months later we had Zhao Jiji born, which is, as most people know, just a highlight of the National Zoo here. And here is, I think, an actual video of an ultrasound of you doing the artificial insemination. Yeah, if you look at the bottom, there is this white tube coming in. Yeah. And Give it a few seconds, you can see sperm coming out from the tube that we were doing the examination. So this is from a uh, 2018 AI that we did. Yeah. Fantastic. That is just so fascinating. Um, so we're having a, a couple questions in the Q&A here. If you have a favorite animal or and or 
um, a favorite animal that you've either collected samples from or done assisted reproduction with? Well, do I have, uh, I think you asked me that question before and like I say, I <laughs> my mind change every day because I like most of the animals. So I don't know, today I probably will say uh, crocodiles because I really like them. They are very cool. Not just reproduction, but <laughs> everything about them is very cool. But yeah, the um, regarding the species that I work with, I think giant panda is actually what I work with the most. They are also extremely challenging to work with, so it's always fun and always extra rewarding when you actually get a cup born from them. Yeah, but other than that, I like most of them. <laughs> yeah. Do we have crocodile samples in the biobank? Um, I don't think we do, but we did um, for a while work with a keeper in the zoo. She is trying to analyze some crocodile egg to find out whether or not they're fertilized in the egg. So that was quite fun. Very cool. Um, there is a question in here from Ray about the case of the northern white rhino. Mm -hmm. um, are we using sperm from many different males um, to prevent um, inbreeding with only two females? Do we have enough samples in order to um, prevent any like too close of samples? Yeah, that is a very good question. Um, yeah, so is are gonna be very complicated. But if I try to keep it simple is that scientists are actually exploring possibilities of not only, not just using those two females that are currently alive. They're actually thinking about using a Southern white rhino, which is a close relative as a surrogate. In that case, they are not limited to the genome from those two females they can use. Um, other other uh, samples they have stored in the past and use their genome. And they do have a number of um, male samples that's collected over time. So overall, the diversity won't be superb, but it also won't be terrible if we can actually introduce all these different males back into um, the population, but again, that that whole plan requires a lot of very advanced biotechnologies. So really, we're we're not there yet, but there are a tremendous amount of work and an international team that's working on it. Wow, that would be really really neat. Um, Noel and Marion have a question of, is it possible to store samples to preserve them in a vacuum, almost like a sealed container? That, that actually is one of the things people are trying, especially in the case of uh, dry samples, because you ideally you want to keep them in an environment that's still stable when it comes to humidity because when, you're, when we're talking about drying, then humidity is a key factor. So vacuum is one of the stable environment. So some people are definitely proposing maybe we can try to uh, store the samples in vacuum for, so that they can be even more stable than they already are. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Sethi has asked about duplicating animals, and I think you touched on this a little bit earlier about cloning. There has been some cloning happening with ferrets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cloning is a technique. I mean, you know, cloning has been done in a lot of domestic animals already. And um, when it comes to uh, endangered species, I think, it's important to know it's to not to treat it as a silver bullet, but it's a technology that is potentially available, but it definitely need a lot of consideration to decide whether or not this is the best thing to do for this particular species, given its you know endangered status and all these other things that need to be taken into consideration. Great. 
So I think best case scenario, all of our animals breed naturally, their populations are flourishing, but we know that because of a lot of things, habitat loss, pollution, things like that, it's not always the case. So we have the biobank, we do assisted reproduction to help the animals that aren't so good at breeding. And we then, third case scenario, we have the biobank to use the samples from animals that have passed to keep our genetic diversity going. And then almost kind of last case, should we not have the genetic diversity, then we could potentially explore more cloning of animals. Mm -hmm. Yep. Fantastic. Great. Um, and I think our last question before we close out today, how do scientists know which species to collect from? Is it the ones that are the most critically endangered or just whatever we have access to? Well, I think both. <laughs> yeah, we definitely have a, the priority definitely goes to the one that is most critically endangered and dangerous species, but really it just, if we can collect other species, we don't just say no to them. <laughs> we collect whatever we can get our hands on. That's fantastic. And so that's where those examples, the giant panda, the scimitar mm -hmm. horned oryx, the black footed ferrets, the Chevalsky horses, mm -hmm. um, those really great Smithsonian stories of using our biobank, using our scientists like you, Dr. Uh, Paige Lee, uh, to really bring back these animals from the brink of extinction. Thank you so, so much for joining us today for Unusual Careers. This has been just an amazing example of women in STEM to celebrate Women's History Month. Um, I have learned so, so much and I'm sure our viewers did as well. Do you have any final words for our viewers? Well, as scientists, we um, ask a lot of questions. So I would just encourage everyone to stay curious. I love that. Thank you so, so much, Paige, and thank you to everyone watching for joining us today. I hope that you will join us for our next installment of Unusual Careers on Friday, April 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, where we will have a very special guest joining us from the Insect Zoo at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Um, you will see some links get put in the chat to register for that program. Additionally, we would love your feedback on today's program. You will see a survey pop up when you close the webinar. Um, educators, please take a few minutes to fill that out. And to catch up on all of our previous episodes of Unusual uh, Careers, check out our YouTube playlist. On behalf of the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, we hope you have a wild day and happy Women's History Month.